Thank you, Barb. Thank you very much. It's so good to be with here with you this morning. And I'll have you know, this is my actually very first time I've ever been in Iowa. Oh, my. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I grew up on the East Coast and then lived many years actually in the West Coast. And so coming to Unity Village and coming to seminary was my first heartland experience. And it's really, really beautiful here. So have you ever asked yourself this question? How come there isn't an easy to follow master plan for life? How come there isn't a blueprint for the best philosophy of living? You know, with all our schooling and studying and training and our personal development work, doesn't it seem like we've just kind of had to piece something together for ourselves or what? works best for us. I mean, wouldn't it have been great if someone just handed it to us and said, you know, here's the master plan for life and here's what you do to have true happiness. Well, if you've ever had thoughts like these, as I certainly have, and I think that many of you have had too, then I think you can probably relate pretty easily today to the words of Jesus um, that he spoke on the Sermon of the Mount. And I affectionately like to call talking about the Bible and studying the Bible, Bible up. Exploring the stories and the characters in the Bible and how they're similar to us and how we can look at their stories and the wisdom in their stories and apply it in our own lives, apply it to ourselves. So for studying the Bible, I always say it's time to saddle up for Bible up and have some fun. Although saddle up is kind of a Western theme, you know, Western cowboy theme, and Bible's more Mesopotamia, so we should go with something like maybe camels. That's it. We should camel up for Bible up. That's how we should do it. Well, as we explore the stories in the Bible and the characters in the Bible, it's helpful to remember that most of us in unity are what you might call refugees. Refugees in terms of that we come from other religious backgrounds. We come from other religious denominations and theologies, or even no particular religious background, into unity. And unfortunately, many times in those other religious backgrounds and traditions that we were raised in, we may have encountered some fear-based or guilt-based thinking about God and about the teachings of Jesus. And we bring those with us here. Another way of saying this is actually we have probably been suggested to what could rightly be called religious abuse. For example, we were all taught we should be raised to be good. And if we weren't good, we would suffer the wrath of God. And we heard many stories and details about what that wrath would look like. For example, burning in hell for eternity. Do you think that just might be a little scary to a young child? Yeah. So as we go along today, some of you may take a few deep breaths and maybe set aside, if you can for a while, some of that religious abuse you have from the past that may be hanging on with you a little bit today. And consider the possibility of separating or pulling apart what you were taught about the Bible from what we know about the Bible in unity and what we're going to talk about today. Like separating those two for a moment, and we'll focus on this today focused on Unity's teachings about the Bible, and maybe not some other teachings that you may have been exposed to. That makes sense so far? Nobody running for the exits yet? <laughs> in Unity, we consider ourselves Christians. Christians in the sense that we follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our way shower. Not the teachings, or not Christians, or Christianity, if you will, in terms of the evangelical or literal word interpretations that suggest that Jesus died to save us from our sins. That's called a blood atonement creed. Or that suggests that humanity is inherently evil. And that today, somehow, we are responsible for a possible mistake that Adam and Eve made 40,000 years ago. Really? Remember, the disciples 
When they and Jesus first encountered a man who had been born blind, they asked Jesus about this. And they asked Jesus, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. In other words, there's no original sin that's passed down from generation to generation. It's not so. And actually, it was just 2,000 years ago. That seems like a long time ago, but in other ways, it's really not that long ago that the Jews and the Gentiles and almost all of the Roman world believed in blood sacrifice. In other words, to be right with God, you had to literally slaughter an animal and sacrifice the blood to God. Yuck! <laughs> I mean, every good Jew would bring a, what was called a spotless lamb, of course, assuming that they could even afford one, to the temple for every Passover. So, after the crucifixion and the resurrection, how to sell the, the story of Jesus far and wide in the Roman Empire? Well, one thing to do was to tie into some of those beliefs that already existed. So, Tell them Jesus was actually a sacrifice to God for our sins, because the populace was very familiar with that idea of sacrifice, of sacrificing to be on the right side of God, if you will, or to be loved by God. And that story actually also helped explain why the Jesus that the early Christians were trying to extol as a very great man, to explain, well, he crucified and died as a criminal. Oops, how do we explain that? Oh, we'll just say that it's all part of the big sacrifice and put a nice bow around it and that he died for our sins and that's really why all that happened. Yuck, again. <laughs> the characters and the stories in the Bible teach us, according to Charles Fillmore, about the process of the evolution of our consciousness from what we call limited or error thinking to higher levels of consciousness and unlimited states. And another way of saying this is to a greater expression of the Christ that lives within us, the Christ of God that's within each and every one of us. Deepak Chopra, who is an author, speaker, medical doctor, he's a world-renowned pioneer in integrative medicine and transformational uh, personal work, he says it this way, love grows when you trust that the universe is on your side. Now, my own history with the Bible began when I was in the sixth grade and in Episcopal Church. I remember the sixth grade Sunday school and we ordered little bookmarks, little Shroud of Turin bookmarks. I remember getting those and I looked at them and, I, and these, these are them, actually, I still have them. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I have little pictures of what Jesus might have looked like. I just thought it was so cool to get these things. And so in high school, I had to take one course in the Bible. And then after high school, I remember I didn't really pay very much attention to it after that. But about four years later, I began to start to read the Gospels just a little bit each night. And I read them from the perspective that I was sitting on that hillside, listening to this man named Jesus. I didn't know anything about him at all. I didn't know anything about what he had taught or said. And I'm sitting there listening to him. And I'm thinking as I'm listening, what is he really trying to tell me? What is it that he really wants me to know? So, if you haven't done it lately, and I leave it open for your definition of lately, whether that's yesterday or 20 years ago. <laughs> I invite you to pull out your Bible wherever it is, and even if it may be covered in enough dust that you might be risking su suffocation, open it up to the Sermon on the Mount. You could be just amazed at what you might discover there. So there's a beautiful chapel built on the Mount of Beatitudes. Joy and I had the opportunity to visit it a couple of years ago when we took a pilgrimage to the Holy Lands. It's a very peaceful and sacred spot. 
It's a little ways up the hillside just north of Capernaum. And it's filled, there's a chapel there now, and it's filled with gardens and places to sit. So one morning, our group of travelers, we sat there and opened our Bibles and read aloud the Sermon on the Mount. Now, these words of Jesus are very well known and have been given high praise as a summary of the gospel of Jesus. But actually, when we look at them a little more closely, we find they are essentially special instructions that Jesus was giving to his apostles. And they're actually part of the ordination ceremony of the 12 apostles. Now, the first part of the sermon, the eight-verse prose poem, is called the Beatitudes. And they can be viewed essentially as a summary statement of Jesus' personal philosophy of living. And he was passed, wanted to pass this on to his disciples. His personal philosophy of living as opposed to the actual gospel of Jesus. So let's review. In essence, Jesus' teachings, Jesus' gospel is, first, the actual fact of the fatherhood of God, that God is love. God loves us dearly as a father or a mother loves their children unconditionally. That's fact one. And fact two, the absolute fact that we are all indeed divine children of this living and loving Father in the sisterhood and brotherhood of humankind. Hence, when Jesus was asked, what's the great commandment? He replied very simply, love God and love one another. That's the gospel of Jesus. That's it. And his whole story and all the rest, all those other things you've heard are just things that have been added. That's really what Jesus taught. So here in this Beatitudes, Jesus is teaching his disciples and each one of us, actually, a master philosophy of life, of how to live. Teaching us that through the experiences of applying the attitudes that he's teaching us in the Beatitudes, applying them to our living, we can develop and strengthen our quality of character and thus open ourselves to creating more true happiness in our lives. This way of living, of uplifting our quality of character as an essential part of spiritual growth, Jesus knew this, that's why he was teaching it to his disciples, is also reflected in that statement that Jesus made, be ye perfect even as the Father in heaven is perfect. So in other words, Jesus was saying, come on, folks, start practicing your unity fifth principle. <laughs> right? Knowing and understanding the laws of life and what they are is not enough. Our fifth principle is we must apply those. We must live the truth that we know. That's what Jesus was teaching. And so as we live by, as we apply these beatitudes in our lives, we grow to be more perfect in character or more in alignment with the perfect divine pattern within us, as Charles Fillmore might say. So you see that? Be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. That's what he was talking about. And wouldn't you know it, it's about changing and growing again. Sometimes, I just want to tear that page out. Can I just maybe skip that part? Because we don't want to have to do all that. We just want to, we want kind of like, we want Jesus light, kind of like Bud Light. You know, we don't want to learn the heavy stuff because we have to, because we might have to do something, do something like grow in our personal character and demonstrate this gospel of love with everyone. Demonstrate in our lives with everyone, not just the people we like, not just the people that vote the way we like, ouch, with everyone. For we have been given this example of love. Love even your enemies, not just the ones you like. That is a higher love that's born out of a greater quality of character. So these eight Beatitudes, are, they're attitudes of faith, and they're the responses of love. Attitudes and responses, which when we apply them in our lives, allow us to step up our emotional responses to whatever occurs. And we strengthen 
our moral character thereby, and thus we allow ourselves in our lives to create true happiness. So the first four of the Beatitudes are I'm going to read the first four for you. Starting here, this reading in Matthew, Matthew 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down with his disciples, they came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Happy are the poor in spirit, the humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So let's look at those first four. Those first four beatitudes are really attitudes of faith. And the first one is humility. Happy are the poor in spirit, the humble. Poor in spirit as opposed to great in spirit great in spirit, or strong in spirit, referring to egotistical, if you will. So that's what poor in spirit is talking about here. Humble, humble toward God. In other words, teachable. Teachable and truth-seeking. Happy are the poor in spirit, the humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the next beatitude teaches us about our des having a desire for a connection with spirit. Happy are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's a sincere desire to know God and to experience the living spirit. Jesus is teaching his disciples, this is how you live. This is how you develop a greater character to be able to love one another. And the next beatitude is about cooperation with God. Happy are the meek, shall they inherit, shall they shall inherit the earth. Meek before God. In other words, your will be done. Another way of thinking about that is, your will be done is really a union of my will with the divine will. Sometimes, I remember when I first heard about, heard that statement of your will be done, it seemed like, well, I'm giving up my own will, giving up everything, and it's all God's will. There's no more me, just God. But actually, it's a union. It's a union of my will and God's will together. So another way to say it would be, it is my will that thy will be done in and through me. Because remember, Jesus was the Son of God and the Son of Man, divinity and humanity together. Union of will. And the fourth beatitude, happy are the pure in heart. That teaches about trust. That teaches about sincerity. About being sincere, being authentic, and learning to trust in one another. Now, while we were in the Holy Lands, we had the opportunity to visit the synagogue in Capernaum, and I had a chance to do the talk there, and I thought it was really neat. Actually, no, it's, it's, there's no synagogue there anymore. It's just all ruins. But it was really a, a fun place to be able to go and, and be there where Jesus, where Jesus actually taught. And they did talk to me maybe about doing a service, but they said they only pay a couple of half shekels and an old goat. And so I thought maybe that I couldn't fit the goat in the luggage department, so that, that wouldn't really work either. <laughs> so the second four Beatitudes talk about responses of love. Happy are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And happy are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So those are responses of love, the second four Beatitudes. And the first one talks about tenderheartedness. Happy are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Tenderheartedness is the responding to others with symphony, sympathy, excuse me, sympathy, and a tender heart. The next beatitude teaches loving kindness. Happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It's following the urge to relieve suffering in others and to support others with kindness and love. Jesus, again, is teaching his disciples how to live a philosophy of life, how to apply the teaching of love God and love one another, how to develop that in their lives. The next beatitude is about peacemaking. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. So it's responding to conflict with a peaceful attitude and a loving attitude and working to the resolution of conflict. And the last beatitude is forbearance. With any of you who have raised, who have raised teenagers, I'm sure you've had some work on that one. <laughs> Happy are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, forbearance, patience, self-restraint. Tolerance, forbearance. So when we apply these attitudes of faith and these consequent responses of love that Jesus revealed in the Beatitudes, we can find a strengthened moral character in us and an enhanced ability to create more happiness in our lives. Well, now here's a few more words on love. I, I really like this quote. The beauty of divine love, once fully admitted to the human heart, forever destroys the charm of sin or the power of evil. The beauty of love. And in talking about love, I can't help but share the story that another reason I really like and the Mount of Beatitudes is a special place to me is because it was in front of that chapel that I asked Joy to marry me a couple of years ago. It was one Saturday, and um, it was just really a beautiful evening. And, um, and then she said yes. Well, actually, she kind of said yes. <laughs> but what really happened was she didn't say anything. She seemed excited, but I wasn't really sure. I, said, I had to ask her, is, is that a yes? <laughs> but it was, which was really wonderful. <laughs> So those times on the Mount of Beatitudes, 2,000 years ago and two years ago, and the time today, right here and right now, in all of our lives and forevermore, will always be about faith and always be about love. And that's the truth. Bless you. So let's take these thoughts of faith and love into meditation. I invite you to take a couple of deep breaths. Breathing in gently, close your eyes if that's comfortable. Gently breathing in and out. So together we allow ourselves To feel the love. To know that the same love that walked the earth was bestowed upon us. This same God presence, the spirit of truth lives within us as us in this very day, in this very moment. We can breathe it in. Humbly knowing that we are one with God.
breathing in this love, opening ourselves to cooperating with spirit, to let divine wisdom and guidance, protection be ours. Express these in our lives with those we love, giving and receiving, trusting in oneness. Love, tender heartedness and loving kindness, forbearance and peacemaking all spring out of the love that is within us, an ever flowing fountain. That we choose to open ourselves to that we may choose to live our lives by. Love, 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 everlasting. Let us take a few moments in quiet self-reflection on love. Yes, yes, the love of God lives within us. Moves through us as us. We cannot but be this divine love. In gratitude, for this knowing, for this experience of the reality of the Divine Spirit. We simply say thank you, God, and amen.